Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining my session. Uh, my name is Artem. Oh my god, so huge image of me. Sorry for that. Uh, I'm working on Kotlin to Wasp compiler in JetBrains. Previously, I worked on Kotlin to JavaScript compiler. And also, I'm helping with source map specification. We will talk a little bit about it during this talk. Uh, yeah. So our schedule is really tight today. So I will try to quickly introduce Kotlin to Wasp compiler, some aspect and facts that can give you like understanding why we made some decisions. Also, we will dive into the in-browser debugging with demos. I created two demos, so we will see them anyway. Uh, and also, we will explore a little bit area of improvements. It's not so big, but there are some items that could be improved. And if we have enough time, I will also try to cover outside of browser debugging. So, firstly, what is Kotlin Wasm? Thank you for asking. Uh, so, JetBrains is a company you may know because of a lot of nice IDs for different languages, for Java, for Rust, for C. But also, this is the company that created the language Kotlin. So, someone of you may know the Kotlin because of Android or as a better Java, but actually, Kotlin is multi-paradigm and cross-platform language. And uh, right now, we have four compilers. So, for JVM, for JS, for native, through LLVM, and the new one for Wasm. So, Kotlin is open source, so I will refer to each file and to some implementation details in GitHub repo. And also, it's developed from scratch, so we don't use any LLVM or something like this. We just grab IR from Kotlin frontend and compile it directly to Wasm binary. Also, we're using some components of Kotlin to JavaScript. Also, we have two sub-targets, one for browser and one for outside of browser. First one called WASM.js, second one wasm -wasi. So, also we heavily rely on GC and function references. It means that if you try to run the binary generated by our compiler in VM that doesn't support one of this proposal, it will not work. Also, we softly rely on exception handling proposal. It means that by default we turn on exception handling, but you have ability to turn off and if some VM doesn't work with it, so you can just turn off and, and it will work. So, this is Kotlin Wasm. Let's dive into in-browser debug. So, this is the application we will debug today. First, uh, originally it was like Android application for our Kotlin conf, and with the Compose multi-platform, we compiled it to iOS and for web. So, let's check how can we debug it. Firstly, let's go like directly in browser debugging. Let me first go to main screen. Yep. And we are here. So, what we can see here, firstly, we debug in by sources. It's not like raw wasm or something like that. Like stepping quark and really readable names, so we can jump there and back by call stack. And also, all the variables are pretty formatted to not be so low level. So for example, in service, we can see that there are some string. It's Kotlin string based on struct proposal, on GC proposal, uh, but we trying to format it to be more high level. So, more to say, let's go to menu screen and try to debug some action. For example, we go to the search, and yep, we are here. So we go step into our search and trying to understand what we grabbed from server. And here you see also some talks, and as you see, they also try to be more explorable. So we're building for hugely some expansion, some faults, so we can unfold it and check what it is. Okay, so something like this, with the high level structures. So this is about the in-browser debug. What's about ID? Let's let also put some breakpoint here. Yeah, and we are here. So the same as we see also pretty nice names, debugging by sources, and organized data to be as high level as possible. The same we can do 
with menu screen with a controller. So let's try to run it. And we have also step into, for example, let's debug a different part. So stack is zero, we step over it, and it's one. So is it good? Not quite sure, right? Because we need to understand what with, with what we can compare. Let's imagine that debugger doesn't provide any debug information to browser. How would it look like? Something like this. So as you see, row was some random names and like data structure are really low level. And we will try to like incrementally improve it. So integrate, add some more and more debug information to this become something like this. So let's firstly start with names. How can we improve them? There is a custom section in the one specification called name section. So it's actually the purpose of this uh, section is to introduce names to show them like really beautiful in your debugger or in WebAssembly text format. So as you see here, it covers model name, function names, and local names. Not too much. Because we're using GC proposal, we also rely on some extension inside GC proposal that gives us ability to also declare names for types and for fields. Also, we want to cover a little bit globals. And this is another proposal called extended name section. We also use it just for globals. So we grab it from our front end, from the intermediate representation. Our declarations has name. And yeah, we just add it in this section. If we just try to wasm dump this uh, binary that we generated by, for this application, we will see, yeah, by the way, it was wasm binary toolkit. Yeah, we will see name for model, name for function, name for locals, for types from GC proposal, and for globals from extended name section. So as soon as we provide all of this information, our debugger from this become like this. A little bit more beautiful. So even in the WebAssembly text format, you see that also locals and functions change the name. But not too good, right? So we definitely want to debug not by binary, but by sources. So how can we improve this? It would be nice if there is a format that can map our instruction to sources, right? And there is a standard called source maps uh, in which I also trying to improve. And uh, this is actually quite easy format. So it's a text format, JSON, not a lot of features. So version always three right now, as soon as we change and in integrate new features, it will be improved and like versions will be changed to four, five, etc. So file is the file for which we generate this format. Source roots just repeated part of paths in the sources. Sources, like our files in which uh, to which we want to map our instructions. Source content, content of these files. Ignore list is quite interesting one. We don't use it yet, but uh, yep, I will talk a little bit more why. But what it does, obviously it makes sources ignored by debug. So what does it mean? For a debugger, it means that functions from files that define it as ignored will not appear in a call stack. So it's about implementation details and also will not not allowed to step into those functions. Names, because the format is not only for WebAssembly, but also for JavaScript and CSS, and there is no custom sections in JS or CSS, the purpose was the same as custom section for names. And mapping is hard of this uh, document, so it's mapping from our instructions to source. So uh, each segment separated by commas, and each segment represents the next data like offset inside the binary, it's an absolute offset. After that, all the parts are optional. Source index, so file in which this instruction. Start line in the file. Start column in the file and name index. So I will not go deeply into the format. So you see the link, you can read about encoding because it's also uh, use VLQ encoding and differential computing. So each next segment depends on the previous segment to reduce the size. But yep, as soon as we 
add something like this. Yeah, by the way, we used all of the data from our IR too. So as you see in IR file entry, we have name and also functions that as we provide offset in the file and we've got line and column in the file. So as soon as we provide all this information and also we need to add a new custom section called source mapping URL. So browser firstly uh, fetch your binary, check this custom section and if there is this custom section, it also try to fetch the mapping file. So as soon as we add this, our debugger become like this. Much more friendly, right? But not so perfect. We want also to customize a little bit variable views because they are too low level. How can we do it? It's an interesting because if we open a console during debugging, and try to explore our locals, we will see that they look like JavaScript objects. And uh, this is because Chrome DevTools and Firefox DevTools, they try you to give an expression evaluation. So, and the only expression evaluation language you can use is JavaScript. So they built views, JavaScript objects, that represent in data inside Wasm. It's actually a little bit problematic and I will talk about uh, it later. But because it's a JavaScript object, we can use a feature called custom formatters. So it's a feature supported by Firefox and Chrome, uh, and it gives you ability to customize JavaScript objects. And because our Wasm values represent as JavaScript object, we can customize them. How? So uh, you need to declare a global variable called DevTools formatters, and it's an array of objects that contain header, has body, and body. So has body is just representing like return true or false if our data is complex, so should it be expanded or not. Header represents this preview of the data and body is the expansion part. So, and it accepts object and return null if we okay with the previous formatting or default one or HTML, really restricted one in JSON ML format. Uh, it looks like this. So it's like an array First element is stack. After that, we have object of attributes. Only style is allowed. And after that, children. So as you see, only span, div, all, you, and like all, only those stacks uh, are available. So how we use it? We declare something like this and list of all formatters. And we listed all possible Kotlin types that we want to customize. I will show you a small one for classes. It's quite easy. <laughs> so. What we do, uh, because we have some implementation details, fields, hash code, e table. So this is not what user define it. This is our in, in, in implementation detail. And we want to hide this. So I'm just going through the object and just remove those, forms, those uh, fields and also remove dollar sign from fields. Yep. And as soon as we add it to the blue code as import, our browser will look like, uh, no, it doesn't work because by default we, it's turned off and we need to turn on this feature and only after that, sound like this. Yeah, so we are here, but not so. HTML, what if your ID can't render some random HTML? This is our case with Fleet I shown you and uh, yeah, to customize variables there, uh, I needed to re-implement the same logic that I define it in custom formatters, but in Kotlin for JVM. Unfortunately, it's closed source, I can't show you, but I promise, I mean, the logic is quite the same as in custom formatters. So, uh, this is it. What can we improve? I mentioned ignore list, and ignore list is something special. I mean, we have a problem right now, I will show it to you, that actually really weird, and in some sense crazy. Run it, yep. Let me go, for example, in main screen somewhere here on the string. So, as you see, we stopped on string and we can do something weird. It's a string literal, but under the hood, we used some intrinsic to check if the string already existed in string poll. If it is, we will not create a new one, so just a few optimizations. But because we use some function to build string, we can step into the string literal uh, in some random web assembly. So this is definitely what we don't want to provide to our user. So, and here ignore list can help us with it. So what I'm going to do with ignore list 
it's to declare some artificial file, like called ignore file or something like that, and refer all instructions like this, like intrinsic, to this file. So this function will be ignored, so there will be no step into and there will not appear in the const stack. Why we didn't use it before? Uh, because it didn't work in Chrome for a while. And uh, thankfully, uh, and really thank to Eric, Liz, uh, I called people from Chrome and said, how can I like, implement it? And they helped me to implement it, and thankfully it's already merged in V8, and I hope it will be available in the next version of Chrome. Next thing, the new scope proposal. As I said, like source map standard is like standard and specification. So it's incrementally improving, and there are a lot of new proposals, actually. One of them is scope. If we check this area, you see that there are a lot of random variables that are not declared in the sources, right? And also, we want to not show it to people. And scope proposal could help us with it. So we just declare scope in our source map and say, okay, in this scope, we have the next variables, and that's it. So only those variables will be shown in the debugger. Uh, also, it could, could help us with the next thing. Uh, in Kotlin, we have inline functions, and as soon as you inline function, right now in source map, there is no possibility to declare that this is inline body. So it means that we don't have ability to step over any function and always will step into this inline function. So also scope proposal could solve this problem. Next thing, expression evaluation. This is the wild area, actually, because I actually don't know how to improve it, and this is why. First problem I met, because I use custom formatters, let's just try to check agenda delegate reader kind that, I mean, obviously shown in our lo locals. And it's undefined, because the value is customized and the original value path is different, so we need to make this dot value dot field dot value. And it's a little bit annoying. So I don't know how to fix it right now, but we collaborate with Chrome DevTools a lot to find some solution. The second problem, do you remember I mentioned it that all the WebAssembly values represented JavaScript object? So you don't have reference to the original structure. And if you want during debugging just call some functions that accept structure, you are failing because you don't have the original reference. And as soon as you try to put as, for example, here, I try to use string and call is white space function that is declared. And yeah, as you see, errors because it's JavaScript object, it's not structure. We don't have original reference to the structure. So yeah, and it's a problem and also we're trying to solve. So one of the solution we propose in case just inside this object also hold some reference to original structure so we can provide the reference itself instead of this JavaScript object. So this is about in-browser debug. What about outside the browser? Oh my God, I'm pretty, pretty quick so I can even show you a demo. So this demo I created not a long time ago and it's not as promising as one before. So I just have a few simple files here. Yeah, from our tests. And what I can do is run, yep, yeah, this is by the way, warmer, and run LLDB connect to the LLDB. Yep, we need to wait a little bit. Yep, we stopped. And we stopped here on the start test. We can break by box the define it here and just go continue and we stopped here. So yeah, it's not quite big as the one before, uh, the problem is, as I said, this demo, I mean, the generation, the basic generation of debug information for outside of browser was created like a week ago. I, I really finished it on Tuesday, last Tuesday. And yeah, we continue to work on it, continue to improve it. And uh, it's quite, quite big area, actually. Uh, I will explain why. Firstly, yeah, 
is still under development. Firstly, we are working right now and trying to make it work for Watson time and WAMR because those two runtimes provide to us both debugging and GC proposal that we can work with. Secondly, Dwarf. I mean, I will not go explain Dwarf because the specification size is around 500 pages. So yeah, I need like three uh, talks like this to explain the whole format. Uh, so let's go through what I've generated. It's really basic actually, so we generate few new sections uh, also custom, like debug info, debug string, debug line, and debug abbreviations. So only debug info and debug lines are interesting for us. So debug line representing this mapping from instructions to original sources. And debug info representing more high level structures, more like about declarations. So you declare functions, you declare locals, types, we'll see it actually. So for these files that I've shown you, we generate this kind of debug information. So what we see here is compile unit, like just we say that this is the binary we generated and few functions. One for box that we break, broke, uh, the second one for run box test and third one start test. Not quite big. So also what's interesting here, offsets. Uh, in source map format, offsets are absolute. So from the beginning of the binary. But in dwarf, it's relative from the code section. It is because in source maps, they also trying to cover use case when you have expression in your global. So in Dwarf, right now, you don't have ability to cover expressions in global because, I mean, it's relative to code section. The second thing was interesting. Yeah, I tweeted about it, but this part. We use Kotlin. Why do we have here C++ language? And this is because inside LLDB, it seems like there is a whitelist of languages. So if you declare Kotlin, Swift, any language actually, it will not work, so you will not break. Uh, I realized only after three hours of comparing Clank output and my output, but yeah, it was quite funny. And actually obvious, LLDB is C, C++, Objective-C, Objective-C++ uh, debugger. So, yeah, and this is a debug line, so it's actually like in whole program, virtual machine that help you to define where, what and how mapping. So when we just explore it, with dwarf dump, we will see that everything mapping like this. By the way, about dwarf dump, I can use regular LLVM dwarf dump. Why? Because GC proposal, because LLVM dwarf dump also trying to parse your binary. And as a result, it's just find undefined instruction and just say, hey, I'm failed. So thankfully to the Gimli project, inside the example, they have their own dwarf dump. So this is one I used. Yep, and also there is uh, a thing in Wasm tool that was really helpful for me called address to line. So we can just provide absolute offset inside binary and it will say to which file and at which line it mapped. So future work, I mean, there are a lot of area of works. Firstly, I want to fully make it work for Wammer, at least for breaking by lines and uh, files and maybe columns. Secondly, make it work for Wasm time because even with this debug information, it doesn't work for Wasm time and I don't know why. And the third one, I want to work it for your VM. Yep, and it's called a power action. If you are a contributor to Wammer, to Wasm time or any other VM and you support GC proposal, please ping me. Yep, I want it work uh, for your VM too. And of course, because we chat brains, we're providing tooling, we want to have a nice tooling Can you not debug through LLDB CLI. So we want to integrate it with our IDEs, so to have a seamless and nice developer experience. So, this is QR codes. First one, if you are interested in Kotlin Wasm and want to read more about Kotlin Wasm. The second one is our public Slack. So you can join it. It's a huge Kotlin Slack, but there is a web assembly room you can join. Yeah, and if you're interested in collaboration you, to make Kotlin Wasm work on your runtime, or you are interested to contribute to source map specification, also please ping me, I'm active here, and I also shared my Twitter. Thank you.